Hello everybody, Scott Golden here with the Pro Wrestling Logic YouTube channel and the All Out review for 2020 AEW All Elite Wrestling All Out pay-per-view. Um, I, as most people who listen to the channel know, am a major supporter of the organization. However, have to say that this last week, the last seven days, has been the weakest I've seen of the company in its um, almost one-year history, you know. Probably two years by the time you factor in the other paper, the the original pay per view. But anyway, not impressed overall with at least half of what I've seen in the last week from the company. And so we're going to go through this review: injuries that didn't need to happen, uh, spots that didn't need to happen, storyline developments that weren't bad but might be challenging later. Just a lot of things. Anyway, the first half of the buy-in show or the pre-show is just um, ultimately interviews with Tony Schiavone and uh, Dasha Gonzalez talking about hyping the the program. I'm not necessarily a fan of uh, that much of this, meaning I think if you're going to do it during the pay-per-view, I think doing smaller segments, let's say two minutes at, at maximum, is a better way. Whereas if I am flipping channels and I'm an existing fan, I'm going to be even less intrigued because I've already seen all this stuff. So either way, you got to get to be a little bit better about using your time wisely. Anyhow, we move on to the pre-show, which was, well, not that exciting for a non-fan. And my thought when doing pay-per-views is always uh, to draw in new people because the, the your existing fan base is going to support you no matter what you do or almost no matter what you do. And I look at things like a pay-per-view as, did I draw in someone new from watching this, especially the pre-show? Anyway, Joey Janela with Sunny Kiss defeats Serpentico with Luther. Um, Joey Janela, not one of my favorite talents. Obviously, I've made that clear before, and he proved it here. The uh, match itself was not good. Um, it, they were fine once they got into the near falls near the end of the match, but it was clear that they did not click well. Uh, Janela jump starts the match and then um, he is sent into his partner Sonny Kiss on the apron so Kiss I think is a guy who has so much more of an upside and I wish they'd get him away from Janela sooner rather than later uh, Serpentico goes after Janela works him over for a bit and then goes to the top rope as if he's going to dive off and jumps down with a stomp so maybe there is a misconnection here um uh, and then the block of a senton by Janela with the knees comes next. Janela is back up, hits a Death Valley driver and a Blue Thunder Bomb. Why so many big matches this early in the contest or in the show? Uh, big moves at this particular juncture are are irrelevant. Um, and I, I think it's proven here. Janela misses a moonsault. Serpentico hits a DDT for a near fall. Serpentico... Uh, takes the ref, and Luther's supposed to grab the foot. He doesn't do it. Um, Janela hits a fisherman buster off the top rope for near fall. Again, top rope fisherman buster used to be a finish. Shouldn't even be a move in some cases, but just a near fall. Anyway, Janela hits a top rope elbow drop for the win. Then we move to the tag team portion of our pre-show, Private Party, defeating... Um, the the Dark Order members of Alex Reynolds and John Silver. Silver and Reynolds have a lot of potential. Private Party, I still don't see it. Not a bad match, but also not the best endorsement for f folks that are not familiar with the product. Uh, Silver and Cassidy begin. Cassidy gets the hot tag, and Quinn gets worked over. Cassidy gets cut off, and Reynolds and Silver work him over. Quinn then gets a hot tag, so we've seen two hot tags in, like, less than 10 minutes. Uh, Silver blocks the silly string. Silver hits a knee and hits a neckbreaker for near fall. Reynolds comes in. Reynolds and Silver hit a tag team maneuver. Quinn hits Pele kick on Silver. Cassie makes it to the apron. Tag in, and both guys hit the gin and juice, which is a modified diamond cutter. Um, Cassidy pin silver again, not bad, but if I'm, uh, promoting, you know, that I want people to spend 50 bucks, is this the way I get them to do it? Certainly not. 
Um, then we move into the pay-per-view portion of the program, and unfortunately, things don't get much better here. Not for my reception, as I had to contact my service provider uh, during the first half hour of the show because the feed kept coming in and out. So they had to send me another bullet or resend the signal or whatever they needed to do. Anyway, um, anyway, so this is the tooth and nail match. Big Swell defeats Dr. Britt Baker with Reba. Uh, not a fan of this either. So, so far they're batting over three. Uh, Britt Baker is, is a woman that has a lot of potential, a lot of talent, a lot of upside. Maybe not the greatest woman's wrestler in AEW but certainly one of the top three and for her to lose in this contest yeah not not a fan um so basically they do the bit at a dentist office we assume it's the office of Britt Baker uh Swole arrives Reba checks her in Baker appears in the background kind of like a movie villain out of nowhere they brawl uh Around the office, Baker hits Swole with a diploma. They go outside into a dumpster. Jumping off of high things seems to be the uh, the motif of the night, I and mean, I'm not a fan of that either. Uh, Reba tries to help Baker, gets tossed in the dumpster for, dumpster for her trouble. They do some near falls out of that. They brawl back inside. Baker traps Swole in the chair. She tries to attack her, tries to stab her with a needle. So now we're like using weaponry here um swole grabs the needle stabs baker in the leg with it baker eventually cannot recover meanwhile reba gets hit with the the spinning elbow that that swole does uh swole hits the dirty dancing and then punches through the flame framed diploma and swole uh, slaps an anesthesia mask on Baker. Baker passes out for the finish. Yeah, not. Bleh. This was this was not good and not a good introduction to anything AEW. If you're a casual watcher or you're, you know, over the holiday weekend with friends and watching wrestling, I know that's less likely with the pandemic than normal. But it's, I'm sure it happens somewhere. Not a good introduction to pay per view. Um, Young Bucks and Jurassic Express have a decent match. Uh, I'd say good to very good, although not anything to write home about like match of the year candidate or anything like that. Good story being told here. Matt and Nick, uh, Nick uh, Jackson are uh, more aggressive now that uh, Hangman's out of the elite. They're kind of rededicating themselves to being the top team in AEW. Um, back and forth from the beginning, uh, Jungle Boy tries a s tornado springboard DDT, doesn't get where he wants to go with it, Matt hits Northern Light suplexes, um, I remember when the Northern Light suplex was a finish, not terribly long ago, I don't know, 25 years ago, and now it's just a series of six or eight of them is commonplace, this makes me sad, anyway, Matt and Jung Jungle Boy, uh, try to suplex each other over the top rope doesn't get where they want to be uh jungle boy barely gets back in the ring after being on the inside bucks cut jungle boy off for the next several minutes marco stunt who is injured from interacting with jake hager uh earlier in the i guess the last few months uh because i don't even remember when the match was but they interacted Supposedly, Stunt has injured himself or is injured because of this. Uh, Stunt tries to use a crutch, but eats a super kick from Matt Jackson for his trouble. Uh, Luchasaurus gets a hot tag. He nails a moonsault press from the apron to the floor. Uh, both teams jump in, and they go back and forth for a bit. Uh, Luchasaurus is a choke slam on Nick. Jungle Boy hits a poison runner on Matt. And then they hit their double team for a near fall. Too many moves, but it is what it is for this uh, particular time and place in wrestling. In the next, I guess, barricade, barricade spot, we see Luchasaurus launch himself into a bunch of 
uh, wrestling spectators, which I am so not a fan of. I understand it's workers. I understand it's a spot. But in a real environment where there's paying fans, all it takes is one kid getting kicked in the head and you've got a multi-million dollar lawsuit. It's not worth it, no matter how cool it looks on TV. Anyway, Jungle Boy hits a springboard into a super kick. Matt covers for near fall. Nick hits a super kick for a near fall of his own. Uh, B-E- PTE trigger with Matt pinning Jungle Boy is your finish. Then we move on to another cluster mess, um, and that's the Casino Battle Royal. Lance Archer is your number one contender for the AEW Championship post this. Uh, the, refer- the ring announcer explains there's four groups of five uh, wrestlers entering at three-minute intervals. Hey, we can go three, four, five if we really want to anyway. Uh, and then one final Joker entrant. Eliminations are over the top rope, both he- both feet hitting the floor or the stage. I like this distinction. Uh, your first group is Trent, Christopher Daniels, Jake Hager, The Blade, and Ray Phoenix. Uh, fine for what it was. Nothing terribly offensive here. Second group, Kazarian, Hobbs, Will Hobbs, uh, Chuck Taylor, Santana, and Ortiz. How sad for Santana and Ortiz. They were in the main event of the last pay-per-view, and now they're in a throwaway battle royal. Just, I understand guys go up and down the card, but that's a major demotion, at least how I see it. Uh, Santana and Ortiz attack Chuck Taylor with a billy club before they even get to the ring. Um, Hager manages to toss Chris Daniels out. That's his one of his bigger spots of the night. Anyway, uh... We move to Billy, Penta, L0, and Brian Cage, Ricky Starks, and Darby Allen up next. They're in the third group. Uh, Billy hits a famous throw on Hager. Not a fan of this because, well, Billy Gunn is 50-some-odd years old, and Hager is an MMA fighter. Shouldn't we have some credibility here in 2020? Uh, Cage tosses him. Right away, Allen hits a code red on Starks, continuing their feud. Uh, He then tosses Phoenix, and Santana tosses Taylor. Um, Then we move to the next group of folks, Sean Spears, Eddie Kingston, Butcher, Sonny Kiss, and Lance Archer in the final official group. Uh, Spears takes his time getting to the ring, saying he's, he's about winning, not about doing the most to get the least. And then Tully Blanchard walks out, gives him the gives him access to the glove which is which is good and cool um then we move to the 21st entrant matt seidel welcome to aew although he almost didn't last very long another guy doing a move just for the sake of moves goes to hit a shooting star press to enter the ring and almost lands on his head luckily he's able to turn lands on his back instead but Risky moves just for the sake of moves because, well, that's what wrestlers do in 2020. Could have ended really badly, and and we see later in the night how things can end just for the sake of moves and spots and all that stuff. Anyway, so so Penta gets thrown out. Kazarian gets tossed by Archer. Cage hits a, a lariat on Starks for his own trouble. Allen throws Starks out, which continues their feud, which is a good thing because their feud has some potential, even though it's an undercard kind of deal. Uh, Starks pulls a body bag, yes, a body bag, which Tony Schiavone doesn't even know what to call it and stumbles over his words. So I don't know if he didn't know that was coming or just he didn't. I, I don't. It was just an awkward moment. Um, and there's Tax, and he he gets thrown over the top rope onto the stage with a powerbomb-like maneuver while in a body bag does Darby Allen, Seidel, and Spears. Fight on the apron. Seidel hits a double stomp off the post on Spears. Spears falls off the apron. Hobbs hits a spine buster on Seidel into some leftover tacks. Ouch. And Archer hits Hobbs with a pounce. Cage and Archer trade strikes. Hobbs and Cage fight on the apron. Archer eliminates both with a drop kick. Uh, your final four, Eddie Kingston, The Butcher, Archer, and Seidel. I actually thought they were going to go with Seidel winning as a surprise. They did not. Seidel tosses The Butcher, though. Archer hits the blackout on Seidel. Kingston throws Seidel off the apron. 
Kingston Archer final two in. They fight on the apron. Blade runs out to help Kingston. That doesn't really help him. Archer kicks him away. Jake Roberts tries to have the snake attack Eddie Kingston. This leads to the referee, the announcers explaining that uh, Kingston's afraid of snakes. Probably something we should have known beforehand. Um, but then uh, Archer does get rid of the Butcher and Blade to get the win. Then we go into the scariest part of the night, uh, Broken Rules match, Matt Hardy defeating Sammy Guevara. So this is, I'm going to rant, and I know this, if you are a fan of high stunt matches, probably want to skip ahead a minute or three. Um, So they begin the match in the football stadium next door. Guevara tries to hit Hardy with a golf cart. He misses. Uh, Hardy hits a DDT on a picnic table as part of the stadium. They climb onto a scissors lift. Now, they're probably 10 or 15 feet in the air legit, right? Garvera, Garvera spears Hardy off the lift. And they're supposed to crash through tables below. Except Hardy doesn't hit the table. They hit, they, they hit it partially, but Matt Hardy's head and shoulders and neck bounce off the concrete. Now... Explain to me where wrestlers became stunt people. Explain to me why a person should risk their life for supposed, quote, entertainment, quote, rather than, I don't know, actually being able to wrestle for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years if you're a young guy. No, instead we do stunts that we don't have the ability nor the training to do in order to try and get a a chant from the crowd, or get some extra pops, or whatever. It's ridiculous, it's unnecessary, and it could have cost a man his life tonight. It was very, I wouldn't even say possible, but the idea that Matt Hardy could have sustained permanent damage, which we still don't know because he's still in the hospital, or could have died on sight, is real. And 20 years after Owen Hart Yeah, more than 20 years after Owen Hart dies from another stunt for the sake of stunts, we still haven't grown as a business to the point where, I don't know, if you're going to do something, do it safely or don't do it at all, should be the the standard. Anyway, so the referee gives the dreaded X signal. Um, Matt Hardy can't stand stand up. She gives the X again. Uh, The doctor comes out. They ring the bell, match is supposedly over, and Hardy then cuts some sort of mini promo on Guevara. He's obviously out of it. If you zoom in really close, his eyes look partially dilated. Uh, The announcers start to treat this as a real situation. they're They're basically treating this as a real injury, and then Hardy's back brawling with Guevara in the arena. Hardy and Guevara climb climb onto another high spot. Hardy hits a right hand. Guevara falls off, crashes through a uh, crash pad, and he's he's knocked out. So, a couple of things. Number one, this should have been taken out of Matt Hardy's hands. He wasn't in a mental or emotional condition, or a physical one for that matter, to defend himself properly. Number two... Anybody who let that person, Matt Hardy, go back out into the arena should be fired immediately. I don't care it's show business. At the end of the day, a person's life is more valuable than any spot. Number three, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but poor Sammy Guevara. If he doesn't go through with finishing things up, he's seen as a punk by the rest of the locker room. If he does, he's taking Matt Hardy's life into his own hands and he doesn't know how bad Hardy's hurt nobody does yet at this point anyway it's irresponsible it's foolish it's carny and it shouldn't have happened not in 2020 not in 1920 (laughs) anybody with any sense wouldn't have let this happen anyhow so um we 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 move forward into one of the better matches of the night uh as the AEW Women's World Championship is on the line. Hikira Shida defeats Thunder Rosa to retain the title. Now, one would assume that the NWA World Women's Champion, Thunder Rosa, would have been squashed by Shida. However, 
they assume wrong. This is probably the best women's match that we've seen in AEW history. Both parties are going back and forth with palm strikes and other strikes early. An attempted ankle lock uh, by by Rosa gets gets tied up. Sheeta does get to the ropes, however. The announcers do an adequate and above average job of putting over the fact that Thunder Rosa has an MMA career and i think thunder rosa when she's done with the nwa or if the trade agreement continues is probably one of the better options that that aew has to stand out with a women's division uh there's a striking battle it continues um there's a there's a knee by sheeta sheeta grabs a chair and sets it up as a launch pad pad for running knee rose rosa beats her to the punch and hits her own running knee off the chair Rosa sends Sheeta into the apron and sends her into the post. Drive-by kick uh, on the apron. Rosa continues to work over Sheeta for the next several minutes. Sheeta hits a vertical suplex and uh, a, a high kick for near falls. Rosa rolls Sheeta up for the, the attempted cover. Rosa hits a running clothesline in the corner, hits a swinging drop kick in the corner, and then Sheeta um, has to fight her way out of a DVD on the stage. Sheeta blocks it. They fight to the top rope. Sheeta teases a superplex on the stage, and this is blocked. Uh, Rosa does get a DVD on the apron. Rosa gets a submission uh, attempt off an arm bar, and she goes to the top, gets cut off with a superplex. Sheeta hits the Meteora off the second rope onto the stage, uh, and then they do several more strikes. Sheeta back in the ring, hits a backbreaker for a near fall, and then hits the running knee for the pin. Best women's match in AEW history. Proof that you just have to have the right women in the spot. Good on both ladies, and this is great. Alex Marvez is interviewing irrelevant people, otherwise known as Kip Sabian and Penelope Ford. Ford says they're getting married. Sabian, uh, Sabian says that they will get married live on Dynamite. First, though, Sabian must have a bachelor party and reveal his best man this week on Dynamite. Hopefully this is a new talent that, I don't know, has some uh, long-term value. Um, then we go to the, I guess, eight-man, uh, tag team match as Dustin Rhodes, Scorpio Sky, Matt Cardona, QT Marshall, with Randy Rose and Alley, defeat Mr. Brody Lee, Hulk Cabana, Stu Grayson, Evil Uno with Anna J. They could have cut this, and it had been fine. At the same time, having it is fine, too. Uh, it didn't really need to be in, on the show, if it wasn't on the show, I don't think it would hurt anything as long as Brody Lee got some cameo time to do something else. Uh, Dark Order attacks early, and we go at it right away. Dustin gets a little bit of shine. Marshall misses, and he gets cut off and worked over. Uh, Cardona hits a heart tag. He hits the radio silence and a dive over the top. Sky is in for a little bit, hits a TKO. Anna Jay and Brandy uh, jump in. Brandy spears Jay. Dustin and Lee tag in. Lee hits a big lariat on Dustin. Lee then tags Cabana. And um, having him set up for the victory, Cabana misses a moonsault. Dustin rolls him up and gets a pin. Now... The fact that post-match this goes to Dustin versus Brody Lee for an eventual um, TNT title match is good. They could have gotten here a million other ways. I don't think they needed this match. I don't think they needed to fill time with an eight-man match that no one's going to remember, but it's here. Uh, you know, it's... I don't know. It's just... It's... It's kind of one of those things where I think they're doing too much and putting too many people on the program just because. Uh, Tony Schiavone interviews Dustin. He informs him that he's set to face Lee for the TNT title on Wednesday. This is a match I want to see. Hopefully Dustin gets the TNT championship and holds on to it for a little bit. I wouldn't even be opposed to him holding on to it 
till the pay-per-view, and my gut is when Cody comes back, he's a heel. Maybe we get another classic Dustin versus Cody match somewhere down the road. Dustin says that if he wins the match, uh, he, he'll win it for Cody. He, he won tonight's match for Cody and can't wait, a ch- wait for a chance to be a champion again. And he will bring everything he's got for Lee on Wednesday. Uh, I am a huge fan of the next match, the AEW World Tag Team Championship match. Uh, FTR with Tully Blanchard defeating Kenny Omega and Hangman Page to win the Tag Team Championship. Probably the best tag match I've seen, I don't even know. 10 years if not longer i like if from a from a u.s perspective i don't count japan because i'm not knowledgeable enough to know it and i've never been a lucha fan so that doesn't count for me but as in terms of in north american wrestling i would say this is the best tag match in at least the last 10 15 years um match is a little too long they go 30 minutes they probably could have done it in 2025 but they were telling us a, a story series of spots that probably was a little overdone the ftr is the best tag team in north america right now maybe the world again i don't follow international well enough to know but best in north america by far and i hope that they are built around for the duration of their contract whatever that that feels like um they do simple things they cut the ring off properly they make holds matter and and count they tell stories with almost every move they make and everything makes sense omega and page work on cash in the beginning dax and cash then work on page omega gets a tag and uh he he tries the uh v trigger among um a dive and I don't know. It just, I mean, Omega, Omega is a guy that I think he's great when he's in there with somebody that, that can pace him and slow him down and get him reined in. I don't like him as much when he's not in there with someone who can do same. I know a lot of people think Omega is one of the best in the world. I think he's great. Maybe one of the best at being carried or evened out, but not, not a leader in the industry by the stretch that people think he is. Uh, Page and Omega do some double teams. Page hits a German suplex. Uh, Omega hits a V trigger for near fall. Omega and Page go for the last call, but Dax blocks it. Uh, Omega cuts him off. They work on uh, and gets his leg worked over for quite a bit. Dax and Cash hit uh, double diving headbutts. They will do anything to take the leg of Omega out. Page and Omega make a comeback. Page misses a last call. Omega hits the V trigger on Page by mistake. The sell by Adam Page here is phenomenal. Page literally looks like he was legit knocked out. Uh, Omega gets his leg chop blocked. FDR hits the mind breaker, spike pile driver. Page kicks out. They hit a second uh, one for a pinfall. And, uh, I mean, FTR, best tag team in in North America. Again, they are your AEW tag team champions for right now. I know this is leading to Bucks versus FTR. Maybe they'll bring a match out of the Bucks that I actually truly value. Um, I'm hoping for that because I'd I'd love to have my mind changed about the Bucks. Anyway, after the match, Tully, Tully Blanchard celebrates with FTR. They leave some beers for Paige and a mocking toast. Omega climbs in the ring with a wooden table. Everybody thinks he's going to turn on Paige. He doesn't. Omega kicks the beers out of the ring. That's the most aggression he shows towards his partner. Um, He walks to the back. The Bucks meet Omega in the back, and they walk out. Uh, Both Bucks follow Omega. Omega wants to leave. Omega gives the Bucks an ultimatum, get in the car with him or not. They didn't. Omega leaves. Um, I assume this means there's a heel turn for Kenny Omega coming somewhere in the future. Uh, 
I, I just, I, I don't know where this is going. I care enough that even though I'm confused at the moment, I'll give it a chance to play out over the next month or so. If they haven't moved to the point where at least I have a hint as to who the heel is supposed to be, I'm going to be a little more frustrated. But they have committed to this storyline, and giving it a chance to see where it goes is a good idea. Uh, the Mimosa Mayhem match, Orange Cassidy defeats Chris Jericho. Um... I mean, it's it's a brawl. It is what it needs to be. Uh, there are vats of the beverage on two sides of the ring, tight sides of the ring. Jericho goes for a quick win with Cobra Breaker. Cassidy uh, fights back, and uh, then Cassidy uses gets hit in the head with a table and breaks a, gets a platter broken over his head. Uh, they tease bumping into the drink quite a few times. They brawl all around the building. Jericho ends up bleeding, although I don't know what from. Uh, Jericho put Cassidy through a table near the mimosa. Cassidy hits Jericho with an ice bucket, and Cassidy hits a Michinoku driver and an orange punch and hits a running PK, PK and a swinging DDT for a near fall. Obviously, no one expects the match to end without somebody going in the drink. Uh, Jericho hits a second code breaker. Cassidy kicks out. Jericho teases uh, lawn darting um, Cassidy into the drink, but it doesn't work. Uh, Cassidy blocks a razor's edge into the drink as well. Cassidy hits uh, a series of irons punches, and Jericho falls off into the drink. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's a it's a it was a fun match. It was good. It was it was enjoyable. It did what it needed to do. Um, Full Gear is announced as the next pay per view. It's November seventh, two months apart. I wish it was three, but I understand why they wouldn't want to run a pay per view yearly in December. A uh, fan tries to grab John Moxley on his way to the ring. I, perhaps the fan's intoxicated. Anyway, your main event, John Moxley, your AEW champion, versus MJF with Wardlow. Moxley wins to retain the championship. Um, getting in Before we get into the details of the match, which I thought was very good, uh, I don't... I wanted more story development here. And... While I understand that MJF winning the championship was not needed nor the right time, I also would have liked to have seen at least somebody lay Moxley out after the match to to give me tease to watch Dynamite because now you've taken your top heel in MJF, and I don't think there's anyone that's, that's a bigger heel in terms of just heel work. Bigger star, yeah, Jericho's that. Um, you know, Co- Cody... Probably bigger than MJF too, uh, you know. There's there's other guys, but as far as heel on this program, you've taken your biggest heel and you've kind of made him look weaker, and you haven't built somebody up. Even if Archer had run out at the end of the match and laid Moxley out, it gives me okay. This is where we're going now. I kind of feel sort of a negative vibe of like you haven't left me caring where the main champion goes. Anyway, um, MJF literally tries to wrestle a match. Moxley sends him to the outside, hits a dive. Too many dives on the show, but we've talked about that already. Um, he then drops MJF crotch first onto the, onto the barricade. Uh, MJF gets a shoulder attack on Moxley, goes after the arm for the next several minutes. Uh, there's actually a cell, a cell point where it looks like uh, Moxley in an old kind of tease the injury spot, teases that his shoulder may even be dislocated. Uh, MJF goes on after the shoulder the entire time and, and for most of the match. Uh, Moxley sends um, MJF into the post with a slingshot and... Uh, this leads to blood. I don't know that MJF bleeding was necessary. It, not this really in the match anyway. Um, Moxley teases popping his own shoulder back into the socket. Moxley hits a overhead exploder suplex. 
and then he hits, uh, starts biting at the blood of of MJF. Not sure I'd do that in 2020. Uh, MJF uses a his finish, but there's a there's a rope break forced. MJF hits um, a heat seeker. Moxley kicks out at two. MJF goes for a second of the same move and hits an air raid crash for the near fall. Um, they brawl back to their feet, and then MJF, you know, uh, hits a thumb to the eye. MJF then hits a crossroads for a near fall, kind of teasing back to the um, MJF, you know, uh, MJF kind of going back to the Cody feud. And then uh, Wardlow takes the ref through MJF, the Dynamite Diamond Ring. Moxley cuts it off, catches it, and uh, hits Paradigm Shift, which is, has been banned for the duration of the match, which the announcers did sell properly. Um, and then hits the Paradigm Shift with the referee's back turned. And Moxley covers, gets the pin, gets the win. Uh, I mean, it's a, overall, the second half of the show was some of AEW's better work. Once we got to the women's match, we were cooking with gas, but everything else on the first half of that show is completely throwaway and not necessary. Anyway, that is where we are. Um, I'll be back with more WCCW stuff. Probably going to have the, the entire year of 1983 up by the end of tomorrow. Uh, and we'll be back for Raw and other stuff. But until next time, keep your feet on the ground, your mind in the moment. Till next time, everybody.